I would now like to introduce Dr. Manuel Borca. Dr. Borca works for the Agricultural Research Service of the Department of Agriculture as a lead scientist at the Foreign Animal Disease Unit at Plum Island Animal Disease Center in New York. He is an international leader in veterinary virology and expert in infectious animal disease. His research on African swine fever and classical swine fever in particular has influenced animal health researchers around the world and has helped others develop infectious disease controls. Dr. Borka's current projects include efforts to control and eradicate foreign diseases of swine, support global control and eradication of foot and mouth disease, and to develop vaccines against swine diseases. Dr. Borka, you should now have control of the screen. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm very glad to be here today to uh, discuss um, the status of the development of African swine fever vaccines in our lab and in other labs uh, around the world. Uh, first, I will try to uh, make a uh, short introduction. Let me get rid of this, please. Short, short introduction about what the disease is, what the virus or how the virus look like. Uh, the African swine fever virus is a very large, but very uncomplicated virus. It has a very large genome of 170, 190 kilobase, huge, uh, encode for more than uh, 150 genes. Uh, but very few of those genes have actually been studied. And we're going to talk about that later on today. Depending on the strain of the virus that acts, uh, the disease can be highly lethal, with almost 100%, although there are other uh, 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 virus strains that produce almost subclinical diseases. Um, this is, is systemic hemorrhagia, edema, ascites, uh, um, a, a complete depression of the animal. The current viruses that is producing the pandemia that we're going to talk today is kills close to 100% of the animals that are infected, and, and usually the, 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 the disease is resolved between uh, five, seven to 10, 12 days with, again, 100% of the animals affected dying. Um, all swines are affected, although some of them, like the warthog, can be infected, but they, not, they don't develop disease. Um, virus and host factors that are interacting during infection and that are responsible for the outcome of the disease are not very well understood so far. As I said before, different strain of virus has different outcome of the disease uh, and has different symptomatology and uh, degree of lethality. Uh, Long-term persistent infection have been experimentally uh, demonstrated, although this is still under discussion. Um, and the disease rapidly diffuses among pigs. And uh, this is slide trying to show what is the picture of the disease out there. Um, as I say, domestic pig and uh, wild pig are susceptible to infection. Domestic pigs uh, develop disease. Uh, there is a third host in, in that interacts also, that is the soft pigs. And the interaction between all these, these uh, um, this host are in two ways, so virus can go from one to another host in either direction. Um, uh, the virus is quite resistant. It stays uh, several days in feces. Uh, in contaminated pens could last for months. Uh, frozen carcasses contain the virus, infectious virus for year. Uh, and for some percent specific, uh, like salt, dry hams, this the virus can survive there for 140 days. So, so there are several sources where the virus can stay and can be transmitted from, from uh, one animal to one region to another. Actually, human have been probably the most important source of dissemination of the disease. Just to have an idea where the disease was in the last, since was uh, described and uh, and the original description of the disease was in Kenya in 1921. Um, arrived to Europe, Portugal, and Spain back in 1957. Uh, from there, or from Africa, the disease went to Brazil and the Caribbean area where it was eradicated. That happened during the 70s. 
the disease uh, was eradicated from Portugal and uh, Spain in the late 90s, uh, although part of Italy, uh, Sardinia, is still is endemic. And nothing happened, the virus is still in Africa until 2007, where there were an outbreak of the disease in the Republic of Georgia. And from there, the virus quickly moved to the Caucasus area, Russia in 2007, Iran in 2008, Ukraine in 2012, reached East Europe uh, in 2014, Hungary also in 18, China in 18, and then the virus started progressing very fast in all Asia and South Asia countries. And the last, I think, uh, that we, uh, we cover here is in, appeared in Germany in September of 22, so 20, 20, uh, 2020. So the virus is covering this virus, the one that was originated in the uh, Caucasus area that we call Georgia isolate. Uh, is covering and producing a pandemic that goes from Central Europe in the contiguous area until uh, the east of uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, especially China. Just some numbers to give an idea about the situation. When the virus arrived in China, after one year of infection, it was 104 outbreaks declared or officially recognized with officially recognized 360,000 animals that were killed because they were in infected form, plus another million that was killed because, killed because to, to prevent the spread. And um, basically, gross numbers, although the numbers are not completely known, but 50% of the population of people in China was reduced in the first, first year. Uh, this, this is extremely serious disease, and there is no vaccine for diseases. And that will be, I will try to focus the rest of my talk about, about that, about what we know about uh, vaccines in African countries. Um, there is only one thing that probably everybody working in vaccine development in African countries will agree. That is, if you have an attenuated strain of virus, so a virus that do not produce disease or produce low levels of disease, and you in inoculate that virus to pigs, almost for sure, those pigs are going to be protected once that you challenge those, those animals with the homologous virus. What, what, what we call homologous virus? Homologous virus is some, a virus that is close genetically and antigenically to the virus that we use in the vaccine. So the statement is clear. If you have an attenuated strain of virus and you inoculate it with that, you probably or almost sure are going to get protection against the presentation of the disease. Maybe not to the infection, but yes, the presentation of the disease if you challenge those animals with uh, an homologous virus. Now, the, the, the discussion starts, you know, how we produce those, what we call attenuated strains that we can call live attenuated vaccines or live attenuated vaccine candidates. There are three ways to produce that. One is by using low virulent field isolates. These are isolates that they were isolated from the field and they were naturally attenuated. They don't kill pigs anymore. And people have been using that for, for, for years. And we are going to talk a little bit about that. The second, the second way is to obtain a, a, a virulent virus and attenuate the virus by passing the virus through culture. While what, what, when we pass the virus through cell culture, the virus start being adapted to grow to those cell cultures and also start losing progressive virulence for the people. And the third way, the third, third uh, option to produce lab alternative vaccines is by producing genetic changes in the genome of the virus by removing a specific genes that are involved in the production of disease. We're going to talk in more detail about that. Let me go to the first group um, because that was the first kind of vaccines that was ever found or ever developed. And actually the experience in Europe in 1960s, there were virus in Portugal that were naturally attenuated and those virus were used as a vaccine in the field, vaccinated many, many animals. And what they found out is yes, these viruses uh, still have some residual virulence. And after six months of vaccinations, start appearing in the field in those vaccinated animals, 
signs of chronic forms of African transmission. And of course, vaccination was stopped right there, and there were no other attempts to use um, that vaccines anymore. But there are several field isolates field isolate that are being used as a vaccines to study immunological aspects of vaccination in, in the lab. And I wanted to, 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 to bring the attention to just two of them. One is what is called ORT TADA3, that is a natural isolate that protects against an homologous virulent virus. And this virus has residual virulence. So this virus, if you inoculate this virus to pigs, some of the pigs, like probably 50%, are going to develop some kind of chronic forms of the disease. And having work that by, by different labs like this from Dick Dixon and Pirre, that try by genetically modifying this, this strain, the old TADA3, by removing some genes that are involving virulence and trying to see if that treatment reduced the residual virulence. And what happened is that they found it that there was no possible. The virus is still produced and has still some residual virulence. And on top of that, what happened is that the, the, the new virus is produced from the field strain by removing some virulent genes, not only didn't solve the problem of the residual virulence, if not that the virus was not as effective as it used to be. Another example in the same way is another Portuguese attenuate virus, the P68, that produced protections against one virulent virus that is called Lisbon. And again, this, this virus has residual uh, virulence. And by, by genetic modification, in this case, uh, our colleagues in, in laboratory of uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Remilia in Madrid, they also modified trying to remove genes that are involved in virulence. And they found exactly the same thing. They were not able to reduce the residual virulence. And, and the immunological aspect remained the same that before the genetic manipulation. So the last example that I'm going to talk about this, and this is important, is because one, it, this is one strain that was isolated in Latvia and is an, a derivative strain of the original Georgia virus. So this strain, that is again a natural isolate, uh, have been used by our colleagues in Madrid to immunize uh, wild swine against the disease by the oral road. And actually, the vaccine worked pretty well. Orally inoculated animals were protected over 90% of the cases when they challenged with the virulent strain. I think that they use Armenia, that is a derivative of the Georgia virus. The problem with this virus, again, is that it has residual virulence. Just the vaccine virus when were inoculated directly in animals, or they were uh, animals were inoculated, inoculated by contact with animals that are being infected before. In both cases, animals that get this virus present in 50% of the cases some signs of the chronic form of the disease. So the full thing I think that should be stressed, and this is my point of view, is that usually low virulent field isolate retain good degree of residual virulence. In my opinion, it's very difficult to think in using a vaccine that still has some power to produce uh, disease, some kind of disease in, in the animals. The second group of way to produce live attenuated vaccines is by, as I said before, obtain virulent virus passes in cells and produce virus that are attenuated. And um, to my knowledge, there is no candidate so far at, uh, uh, that had been produced by this methodology to produce protections against the uh, Georgia strain or the, 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 the derivative viruses. So I don't think that there is any, any candidate produced by this way that still uh, that could be, could be used to protect animals uh, in the current pandemic. But let me make a comment. Um, there is a, this is just a paper that is a very good paper summarizing all the strains of virus that have been producing for over 50 years in Russia by this methodology. Although, again, I don't think that none of these strains are able to protect, uh, produce protection against the uh, Georgia virus. But one comment that I would like to have as a, as a 
to you today I, I, I leave you with the message is we 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 probably we try to uh, adapt uh, the Shorsha virus to a very well known cell line that is called Vero. And what happened is that yes, we we make like hundred and ten passages of the of the cells, uh, the virus in different in different cultures hundreds hundred and ten times. And what we saw it as while the virus progressively get adapted to grow in the venous cell and lose the virulence or the P. There was something that is very interesting and have been described for other people that have tried to do the same. That is, the process of adaptation is uh, accompanied by a huge genomic changes in the genome, in the genome of the virus. So huge deletions of genes occur along the adaptation. Uh, I don't want to get too much technically, but of a virus that is has 160 kilobases, we probably can lose 30 kilobases. So, of course, a virus that loses this amount of genome is almost unpredictable in terms of what will be the ability to produce disease or to produce protection if it's using as a vaccine. In this particular case, we were not able to develop a vaccine by adapting to our social virus to, to beta cells. So one important point that I think is that for everybody that work with attenuation by passaging in cell line, and I'm going to go back to this point at the end of my talk, is that the adaptation of virus to grow in cell line implies uh, dramatic genomic changes on, on, on that virus. So let's go to the last step that is, or the last point, uh, whole, or, or the last way to, to produce live attenuation. That is by genetically modified the genome of the virus. And genetically modified so far means eliminate things that have something to do with virulence and produce them attenuate the strain. This uh, looks simple. Actually, it's the product of the work that have been done in Plum Island in, in during uh, the, uh, 1990. And, and basically, that was at that time a revolutionary technique that allow us to get a virulent virus and by one specific methodology, uh, remove a specifically one, or group, one group or one specific gene from the genome of the virus. And we were able to produce what we call recombinant viruses that are viruses that have the complete genome of, except the small deletion where one gene or a group of genes are eliminated from the genome of the virus. By producing those recombinant virus and then testing them in pigs, we were able to, by first time, identify viral genes that produce attenuation, viral genes that are involved in virulence and by removing them produce attenuation. So a viral that virus is attenuated is in some way a vaccine candidate. So, because that worked, it was possible at that time, the identification of three genes, NL, uh, UK, and 9CL, that's not the name now, that were the first three genes that had been ever uh, identified in African soil fever as producing disease. I, by removing them, in each of these cases, and a strain of virus was produced that when inoculated in pigs was attenuated, and in the three cases, when the animals that were inoculated with this attenuated strain were challenged with the virulent virus, they were protected. And these were the first three examples where a vaccine can be rationally defined by genetic manipulation in African soil. Basic, let me go back to the genome of the virus a little bit. As I said before, huge 170 and then 90 KKD more than 150 genes described, probably no more than 30% of them have been studied. And by, by, by doing these recombinant viruses, uh, this, is, this is a table that I took from a paper of our, our colleagues in PIVE, they put together all the recombinant viruses that have been produced at that time. I update a little bit the data for you, and basically out of the 100 or more than 160 genes that are in the virus, 29 genes have been used have been studied by this way, by deleting from the genome and see how they behave in the animal. By doing that, 10 genes, a group of genes have been in, uh, identified as important in the process of illness. And eight genes 
have been basically used to produce recombinant viruses that can be used as experimental vaccines. So what I'm going to do now is to go through all the documented uh, reports or the documented virus that have been produced by recombination where we can obtain a recombinant virus that can be used to produce protection against the acting strain, the one that is producing the pandemic right now. Let's start with one virus that we produced from Plamylan back like five uh, years ago, that is uh, the Georgia virus, where we delete one specific gene that was 9GL. 9GL was one of the three genes that were originally demonstrated in Plamylan to be involved in virulence. And we delete that gene because the previous experience, deletion of this gene in the other strains that we used before produced completely attenuation and was good as a candidate vaccine. That is why we start with this gene. Uh, and, and what we did is we produce a virus that lack the Nancia gene and we put it in pigs. And what we see is that these are a, a, a doses, 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 are doses of virus that we put. And what we saw is that with 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3, that means 100 doses or 1,000 doses, animals were completely, uh, uh, the virus were completely attenuated. The animal didn't present any sign of the disease. But surprising for us is that when we put a little bit more, 10 to the 4, all animals die. So deletion of this particular gene, the 9CL, produced attenuation in the short strain. But the attenuation was not such great as what we did in the past with other strains of virus, like the Malawi here, that where we can put uh, 10 to the 4 and the animal completely survive. So deletion of NICL produced an attenuated strain of virus that we show also in that paper that uh, can be challenged and the animals get protected. So if you use the right dose of this virus, 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3, and you challenge the animals with the short strain, the animals are going to be protected. The problem here is that the virus still has some residual virulence, and if you put 10 to the 4 more, the vaccine is not working as a vaccine because it kills pigs. It has some serious residual virulence. So what we learn from that vaccine is that if we use what we call sublethal doses of the vaccine, produce protection against clinical disease produced by the short strain. And one big lesson that we learned at that time is that deletion of one particular gene, like this 9CL, does not produce the same level of attenuation in short virus that what we have shown before in other strains like Malawi or Pretoria. And this lesson that we learned with this virus and with this gene, we have seen the lesson repeated several times in the last five to six years where we have seen that deletion of the same gene, even if it's very well conserved across isolate, not always produce the same effect in terms of attenuation. To try to solve the problem with this NICL virus, what we did is to produce an additional virus that we call NICL UK. And what we call it that because what we did is we, pro we produced a second deletion in the 9CL virus. And the second deletion is basically, this was the deletion originally with the, of the 9CL virus, or the 9CL gene, sorry. And what we did is we delete an additional gene that is called UK. And then we end up with two deletions in the same virus. And that's why we call the virus 9CL UK. Both genes have been deleted. At that time, it was a kind of revolutionary because that was the first time that a, a virus have been attenuated by deleting two different chains, completely at different positions in the genome of the virus. This virus was tested at different doses, and even at 10 to the 6, that is a huge amount of virus, animals are completely healthy. So the virus was completely attenuated. The deletion of the additional gene produced a complete attenuation of the residual virulence that the 9CL by itself uh, had. And when we challenge these animals um, uh, with the, in the, with, with the, with the uh, virulent virus, we saw that a doses of 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 6 animals were protected against the challenge. So interesting also, we tried to test how early the vaccine could function 
And this is, the, we, develop, we, we find out that animals can be protected as, as soon as two weeks after the inoculation. Actually, this is the only data so far that I know that showed that vaccines, life alternative vaccine in African frontier can protect, can produce immunity as early as uh, uh, two weeks after infection. So what we learned with this vaccine candidate? Well, that additional deletion of UK in the context of the Niger virus increased at least 100%, uh, 100 times uh, the uh, level of attenuation of the original Niger virus. And also that protection can start, the onset of protection can start by the second week of inoculation. And this is a good candidate. I'm going to go back to this at the end. Uh, that, that, that is one of the candidates that we're pushing uh, right now. Another virus, another candidate that we developed at Plum Island was one that was located in one, in, in a, a deletion that was located with genes that called multi gene family 360 or multi gene family 505. Why family? Well, because what happened is that there are several genes that are alike and are clustered in what is called multi gene family 360 and another in multi gene family 505, and they are more or less close in the genome. And wh why we got interested in this virus? Well, in this gene, sorry. Well, the first thing is that several, sorry, several of the natural attenuates isolate that I mentioned before, these two Portuguese virus that we were talking before, present deletions in this area of the viral gene. So we know that could be some kind of correlation. Also, those viruses that get adapted to cell culture and they got also attenuation because that passage also produced has some deletions in this area. Also, uh, the other important point is that these genes have been for a long time characterized as being important in the immunomodulation of the host immune response against the infection. And so, because, because those clue, what we try to do is to delete some of the genes and see what happened in the, in the disease produced by that recombinant virus. And basically, we published our results like five, six years ago. And what basically we did is to remove six genes, three of the 505 family, three of the 360 family, and we, we eliminate those genes and, and see we measure the phenotype of the virus when we inoculate in pigs. And what we find out is that the test doses 10 to the 2, 10 to the 4, and now we have tested later on doses almost 10 to the 5, and all the animals remain completely asymptomatic. So deletion of this particular gene produce a, a, a solid attenuation of the virulence of the virus. And when we challenge those animals inoculated either with 10 to the 2 or 10 to the 4 of, of, with this virus, all of them were very well protected against the presence of the disease. So this, this virus, uh, it, it, it is interesting because a few months after we published the paper, our colleagues in, in England produced uh, a paper where they took almost the same area, although larger, they eliminate nine genes instead, instead six, like what we did. And they showed that the attenuation also happened with a, a non-related strain that is called Benin. Uh, and they show also that can be used as a vaccine. Uh, now, Benin strain doesn't induce protection against Georgia, so it cannot be used as an experimental vaccine in Georgia, but it was a good point to support that what we did at Plum Island originally also can be done in other strain of virus. Interesting, our colleagues in China developed a virus, a series of virus, and one of the virus, it was a, a, a recombinant virus is using the Chinese strain, the virulent Chinese strain, and they did actually, they delete exactly the same genes that we delete in Plum Island. And, and they got a similar result. The animals were inoculated with the virus so that they were perfectly healthy. And when they challenge the animals, they produce protection. So in general, we should say that deletion of these genes, the 365 gene family, efficiently attenuate virus virulence. So we have as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, an attenuate factor. And also virus having delete these genes uh, produce protection against the presence of the disease when they are challenged with the homologous virus. Um, an extension of the work have been done also by the same paper from our colleagues in China, where they add 
one deletion more, they delete another gene to the six multigene family, that is the deletion of the CD2 gene. It is interesting because the deletion of the CD2 gene by itself, and they show that in the paper, does not produce attenuation. And that confirmed previous results from our lab, where we showed that deletion of the CD2 gene in uh, the Georgia strain does not produce attenuation at all, even if they use by different roles in intramuscular international or different doses. But they add anyway the CD2 deletion to the multi gene family deletion, creating a gene as a virus that's called 7 CD. And this virus, of course, was completely attenuated in pig and still produced protection after the child. And um, in this virus, they make some reversion to virulence study, means trying to see how easy the virus can revert to virulence. And they show that the virus is pretty, pretty safe, pretty stable. This is a virus that our colleagues in China are using for field, uh, uh, field trials. Um, and I'm, I don't have information about how well uh, those, tr those trials are, are moving, but I hope that's going to be pretty soon some, some, some published uh, data about it. One point that um, is, is has been very obscure until uh, the this paper is um, how long of animal that is vaccinated with uh, a vaccine, like a, a vaccine produced by deleting the gene, multi-gene family, produce protection. And there was a very interesting paper by the group on, of, of uh, Pilgrim, where they showed that with two viruses, the ORT ADA3 that had deleted the multi-gene area, and that virus that I commented before, the one that they produced deleting multi-gene family in Benin, they used these two viruses and they found out that both viruses produce protection when they were tested at, at normally one month after the vaccination. But when they went further, 130 days, sorry, 130 days post vaccination, they start losing the ability of being protected. I had to mention that the virus that they use are based on the multi-scenario deletion. Uh, we are right now testing a um, uh, a long time experiment, six months with another viruses that we produce that are not the one that had division in multigen to see if this phenomena of short, let's say, um, uh, protection that have been published in this particular paper can be extrapolated to other uh, viruses that are attenuated by not by deleting because of the deletion of the multigen area. Um, let me go to this particular virus that is quite interesting. This is have been produced, it's called BA71, Delta CD2. This is a virus that is based in an old Spanish isolate, BA, uh, isolated in the year 72, 71, where our colleagues in Barcelona, my, my friend Fernando Rodriguez, produced a virus by making some genomic changes. And the more important of those changes was the deletion of the CD2 gene. And he produced this virus that, again, is not genetically related with the Georgia virus. Again, this is based on an Spanish, all Spanish virus. And by doing that, they found first at all that deletion, these modifications, including the deletion of CD2, produce a completely attenuation of the virus, while the parental virus repeats. Now, of course, like almost to everybody, when they challenge the animals that were vaccinated with this virus, with the virulent virus, the animals resist the challenge. But very importantly, and this is the only documented data so far that I know, when they challenge also with the Georgia virus, the animals also get protected. So this virus has two important characteristics. One, that induce protection against the challenge with an homologous and heterologous virus. And the other thing that is important is for some reason that we don't understand very well, this virus grows in a stable cell line, cross cells. And this is critical because if we think in terms of going from experimental vaccine to, to, to a commercial vaccine, we will need to produce large amount of virus. And the ability of a virus to grow in a cell line and establish, establish cell line is a very important factor in terms of thinking of producing massive amounts of virus. I should say here, that most of the virus that we produce, and other colleagues in China or in England, 
the virus needs to be replicated in swine macrophages that are primary culture, and that's difficult a lot, the idea of making large amount of virus in order to produce vaccine. Although there are people that are st uh, standardizing those protocols and can be produced. But obviously have a virus that grows in cell line facilitate a lot the transfer from the experimental uh, result to uh, a commercial vaccine. And this is a very important issue for this particular uh, virus. One virus that have been developed by our colleagues in Pirre, Linda Dixon, is a virus that with the Benin strain, again, Benin strain is different of the, the strain that produced the disease in right now, but they found that for the first time that deletion of one particular gene produce attenuation of that, 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 uh, that strain Benin. And the, the, the Benin strain having deleted this gene, that is DP148R, actually, as I say, the virus became very attenuated. And when the animals inoculated with this virus, with the Benin vaccine, uh, the, when they were inoculated with the virulent homologous virus, they were completely protected. And the protection could be done if the vaccine is done by intramuscular or by oral route. So this is a great virus for the Benin strain. Why, why I'm bringing this here? Well, because our uh, colleagues in China trying to delete the same gene to attenuate the Chinese strain that, yes, is related with the Georgia virus. And what they found is that that doesn't work. So this is another very good example where deleting of one particular gene that is highly conservative in one strain produce attenuation and in another strain does not alter the virulence of the virus. Let me go back and um, just to start wrapping talk, talking about one, one virus that we did lately in, in Plum Island is called uh, I177L. This, this virus has been made in the short strain by deleting one gene that had not been previously characterized. That is called, again, I177L. We make a partial deletion of that gene and we obtain it, uh, a virus that when tested in macrophage grows pretty well, less than the virulent virus, but grows pretty well. And when we put this virus in animals at different doses, 10 to the 2 and up to 10 to the 6, all animals remain completely healthy. So the virus is completely attenuated. Uh, and when we challenge those animals with uh, the virulent virus, all the animals were protected. So this, this vaccine candidate has several very good characteristics, uh, uh, at least at the experimental level, that are low doses of virus produce protection. Even 10 to the 2 uh, doses of virus induce a very strong level of immunity and protection against the child. The virus is very attenuated. Even if you administrate 10 to the 6 doses of the virus, the animals are completely uh, normal, so it does not have any residual difference. An important issue was that in the experimental condition, the virus doesn't shed. So it means that animals that are vaccinated with the virus does not transfer the virus to animals that co uh, uh, habitating with the vaccinated virus. And also, when administrated at right doses, induce what we call sterile immunity. That is something that this is the first time that we saw in any of our viruses, that is, the, when you challenge the animals with, with the animals that have been vaccinated with the virus are challenged, you don't see when you use the right doses of vaccine, you don't see uh, replication of the um, challenge virus, what is a very highly desirable uh, characteristic. Uh, as I said before, our viruses need to be replicated in swine macrophage, what could pose a problem uh, bringing the animal from the experimental to the industrial level. So what we did is we're trying to see if we could find a cell culture, a, a cell a, um, a cell line that supports the replication of our I177L. And to do that, what we did is we screened a lot of cell lines that are available out there. And we find one cell line that is called uh, a Plum Island porcine epithelial cells, we call it PIPEC, and the virus, after a short period of adaptation, five passes, the virus replicates pretty well in, in macrophage. And the genomic 
alteration that take place during that short period of uh, adaptation are very well conserved. So the, the, apparently the genome changes are not increasing by passing the virus. And the replication, as I say, of this virus in paper pipex cell are almost the same in the ability of the virus to replicate in macrophage, what is very good. We can produce five, six log of increase in titer, what is a very good yield for African swine fever. Uh, and as I said, the paper cells are a situ cell line that can be used for vaccine production. This is the last virus that we have produced. And when we tested pigs, we saw that the virus behaved pretty well. Animals inoculated with the range at 10 to the 2, 10 to the 6, like it happened with the original virus, with the original I177L, they are protected against the challenge. And when uses also the right doses, the, uh, the, there is a status of a, a stable immune. So, as a summary of this particular virus, the 177L can be produced in macrophage or, or pipex cells, 100% protection even at low dose, 10 to the 2. And, and, and this, this virus adapted can be used for vaccine production. Let me go through some of the, what I feel are gaps on, on the vaccine, on the development of a vaccine for African swine fever. And, and, and still we have to remember that there is no commercial vaccine out there for African swine fever so far. One thing is that all the viruses that have been in producing in our lab or, or, or not the lab, there are a lot of uh, critical aspects that need to be studied. We need to understand better onset and duration of immunity. We need to understand better genetic stability of these viruses. We need to understand better also how stable the attenuated phenotype is. We have to determine minimal protective dose and also test different roles of inoculation. We are working on that in our I177 virus, and we're going to very soon submit the paper where we see show that oral road can be used uh, as a vaccine, as a, vac as a vaccine uh, uh, road for uh, alternative road for vaccination. Uh, one important thing is that when you put together all the papers that are out there develop in, 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 in uh, dealing with development of African surgery vaccine, you see that there are a huge variety of variables used, in, used by the different labs. Uh, the, the, the dose of vaccine is different. The, the, the route of inoculation of the vaccine is different. The, and this is very important, the dose of challenge virus is more, very different. So, so we need to make an effort all of working together to standardize a way to test vaccine because at this point today, it's very difficult to say if the vaccine produced in this lab is better or not or worse than the vaccine producing in this lab because the methods that have been um, uh, evaluated are completely different. I think it's, it's time also to develop vaccines with DIVA capabilities so animals that are vaccinated can be differentiated from animals that have been infected with wild type viruses. As I mentioned several times, the deletion of the same gene not always produces the same effect. And I think that that is a very important point that needs to be understood why that happened. And it's not only academically important. It's not that if we have a new strain of virus that came from, let's say, Africa in the near future, and the vaccines that we produce now for social virus cannot protect this new strain. We need to have the knowledge to know how, how we can attenuate the new strain based in the data that we have right now. And that is why we need to understand why these differences in, this, in, the, 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 in the, 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 the deletion of one particular gene have different effects in different strains. And finally, I think that we should Keep continuing with the discovery and characterization of this what we call virulent associated gene. We are where we are right now, transferring viruses to industry because we have been able to identify genes that produce recombinant viruses that can be used as a vaccine. And that, that is because we invest a huge amount of effort in investigating, identifying, and manipulating those genes. So that is something that we need to keep, keep working and, and enhancing our knowledge about the function of each of these genes in the process of replication and important in the production of these genes. Finally, I just wanted to summarize our vaccine candidates developed the Plamina, the 9CL virus, the 9CL UK, the multi gene family, the I177L, and the new candidate that we call I77L uh, Delta RPR, that is a virus that grows in the pig itself. Um, I will 
to say that all these candidates have been patented so far, and all several of them, I would say all of them, are in the process of being licensed by uh, different companies that hopefully will test them uh, to see if uh, any of these virus can can uh, uh, reach commercialization and actually be used on the field. Um, I would like to thank all of you for, for your attention. And if there is any question, I will be happy to, to answer. All right, thank you, Dr. Borka. Before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief video, and then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. Okay. As the global leader in choline, Balchem has spent more than 50 years perfecting the art and science of choline chloride production. The new Puricol line delivers the highest standards of quality, produced in state-of-the-art manufacturing facilities, and backed by the strictest process controls for a level of purity, safety, and consistency you can't find anywhere else. Turn to Puricol choline chloride from Balchem for an unmatched level of quality you can trust. Visit balchemanh.com to learn more. All right, as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane on the attendee control panel. Uh, Dr. Borka, uh, first question I think probably on uh, everybody's mind is, so when are uh, vaccines going to be available, and I know that's that's going to be it depends, right? But what what would be your best estimate? Um, to, uh, honestly, I I don't have a real answer on that because, as I say, several of our vaccines, as well as other laboratory vaccines that I mentioned, have been transferred to 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 industry, and it will be depend on the process that those companies um, uh, apply to testing of vaccines plus will be um, the uh, regulators in each of the countries where the vaccines will be of uh, use, but it will be up to them to to establish the protocols for approving the vaccine. So it's completely out of uh, our hands uh, that, and and it will be very difficult for me to say something um, in terms of with, 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 with having some, some, some possibilities that will be true. I hope that it's going to be fast, but we're talking about in third probably a year. Okay, all right, very well. Um, so one of the questions we've got here is that uh, the virus has been around for a very long time and was uh, somewhat dormant, it would appear, for quite a while, and then recently has really started to work itself uh, across the globe. What What's happened? What, what caused that? I think that... The, the virus have been dormant for the rest of the world, not for Africa. The virus have been very active in Africa all the time. What happened, I believe, is that the communications and the transport of goodies around different countries make this happen. Um, the original, as I mentioned before, there were some, some escape of virus uh, from Africa to, to Spain and Portugal in the 60s. Even the virus escaped to Brazil and Caribbean areas in the 70s, uh, and, and the disease was controlled after after, after a while. Um, and, and now the, 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 the explosion that happened in 2007 by the appearance of the broad, the, the outbreak in, um, in, uh, in the Caucasus and spreading to Russia and East and West, I think it's everything had to do with the human transmission of the disease in different ways. All right, very well. Uh, from your presentation, it was obvious that there are multiple strains that have been developed and, and that are currently active. How many uh, distinctly different active strains or variants are there, and which one would be the predominant one? Okay, we're talking about vaccine strains, right? Because in the field, let's, let's make a difference between what is vaccine strain, those are that experimentally are being developed 
uh, and the strains of viruses causing disease in the field. These are two different chapters, right? Uh, in re regarding the, the vaccine strains that can be used, we have the candidate that we have produced at Pomylan that I mentioned in my last slide, and there are um, probably two or three more that have been published. I mentioned the one that have been developed from the virus isolate, uh, the field isolate in Spain, and also the one that have been developed in, 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 in Barcelona by Fernando Rodriguez. So I would say that altogether maybe there are 10 candidates that have been published. I don't know if there is other candidate that have not been published. All right, thank you. Um, got a question here. What is the risk that an attenuated virus um, from a vaccine will evolve back into a virulent strain? Okay, this is a, an excellent question. and. Um, what happened is this, um, as, I, as I mentioned several times, there is a, pros, a problem of reversion um, or residual virulence. And that's something that we need to understand the difference between residual virulence and possibility of reverting to virulence. The residual virulence means that the virus by itself, when used at high dose, is still is able to produce a disease. And I mentioned several cases. So it will be the right selection of the right candidate vaccine if that, those that that doesn't have or don't have any residual virulence. That's true. Now, reversion to virulence is a different story. It means that the virus, when it starts being replicated in the animal, for some reason, produce some genomic changes and go back to virulent. I don't think that that is a very possible situation. All right, thank you. Uh, I've got a question coming in from Lucas. For the LAV produced by the field isolate, are the animals that developed chronic disease able to transmit the, the virus to healthy animals? We're talking about, um, you're talking about the, 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 the strain of virus that were used in, in, um, in Portugal or the, the, the new virus that is being developed in, in Madrid? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm, I'm reading this as it would be the virus okay. from Portugal. Let me, let me answer. Let me answer both things. The virus that have been used in the 60s in in, um, in Portugal as a vaccine virus, and they produce those that that chronic disease that I I, I mentioned. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if the virus was uh, the, the the virus was shed by the infected animal. There is no, as far as I know, there is no data about that. Regarding the virus that is being used and developed by, by our colleagues in Madrid, um, the, the virus can shed because um, there were some experiments done by cohabitation where viruses, animals have been vaccinated and animals that can be put in contact, receive the virus and develop some of them sign of the disease. All right. Um... So is the vaccines that you've uh, created so far, are they effective against all variants or? No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's something that is very important. There are several strain of viruses, what we call isolate, that is virus that have been isolated in different geographic area all, all, along the time. And no, it's uh, as a general rule, and there are not many, many studies, but as a general rules, what we do, People are working with vaccine know that your vaccine is going to for sure protect against your homologous virus. And you have to do your experiment in order to show that your vaccine will protect against a non-homologous virus, another isolate. It may happen, but probably it's also possible that that's not going to happen. So it had to be tested experimentally in order to see if your vaccine will or not protect an heterologous virus. All right. Next question comes in from Roger. How much concern do you have that all of these manipulations of the viruses in many different labs with very le various levels of biosecurity will, will produce a virus that will be more virulent than the current viruses? The manipulations that our lab and most of the other lab produce are deletions. So it means we eliminate part of the genome. It's very, very unlikely that those deletions 
uh, will first allow the virus to revert to virulence because those deletions are going to, it's, it's a loose of genome of the virus. The virus is, doesn't have that part anymore. So um, uh, I would say that it's, um, it's very, very difficult to, to, to think that those virus can become virulent again. All right, thank you. Um, this next one comes from Z. Um, I would like to ask if any of the vaccine virus candidates, especially the, uh, looks like I177L, deleted Georgia strain in terms of its safety in pregnant sows, does it cause uh, transplacental infection and is it effective on piglets? That's as our experiment that need to be performed. That's when I'm saying that this, this virus is uh, need to be tested in several in several scenarios um, before it can be used to, in order to study if the um, that the absence of virulence that we have tested in Plum Island, and this is a separation to other people working in other labs, those those initial experimental uh, uh, trials it had to be had to be complemented by others. Uh, and I expect that probably companies are going to do that, that um, show that the virus in different conditions, in different scenarios, they still remains available. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question, kind of an obvious one, I think, given the, the pandemic we're all going through, but uh, comparing vaccine development for ASF versus the corona or the, the coronavirus, um, what does this process, why does this process take so long uh, versus the extremely rapid development of the COVID-19 vaccine? I guess one of the answers would be we don't have warp speed for uh, uh, African swine fever. But right. Go ahead. Right. Right. Well, I think uh, I think that uh, there are many many factors that are in, in, included in that. Uh, uh, one one is the, of course the manpower that is put on the COVID vaccine that have been never seen before, and correlated with African swine fever. Just let me tell you, um, in African swine fever in 2007, when this outbreak started, probably there were no more than two labs in the world producing trying to study the disease. So right. differences are huge. Besides, yeah. I believe that coronavirus system is much more uh, known. The virus is small. There have been other coronavirus that have been studied before and vaccines have been developed, I believe. So uh, the, the background of knowledge is much more, uh, of course, in the case of corona that Africans have to But again, I think, the number of laboratories that were involved um, in the study of African swine fever along the years is so small that that's one of the reasons that why vaccine had not been produced before. And, and, and if you consider the amount of publications in the last, I would say, five years in African swine fever, 10 years, it has been increased logarithmically. So we will, we will probably, right now, there are a huge amount of laboratories uh, 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 that are working in, in African Sahara around the world compared with what it was 10 years ago. All right, thank you. We've got time for one more question, if that's all right, Dr. Borka. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, this one comes from June May. Uh, what's your view of the recent surge in African swine fever in China, which some people think is due to illegal use of gene knockout vaccines? Um, I have this the, the, the same information from from the press and, and I, I cannot open I cannot have any opinion basically in what is what those press release uh, are. The only thing that I would say is that the only two papers that I know, scientific report that I know about the analysis of the viruses in China uh, show that there are some deletions that can be can be compatible to uh, just natural um, evolution of the virus in the nature. So these two scientific reports that are the only two that I know, um, doesn't point at are the vaccine virus. I'm not saying that it's not the case. I cannot have any opinion on that because I don't have any uh, scientific evidence to support that. 
certainly understandable. And I want to thank you, Dr. Borka. This has been very enlightening and uh, very enjoyable. And I want to thank everybody else for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balkium.com and we'll forward them to you along with the unanswered questions from today's session. We have two webinars coming in April. The first will be April 6th with Dr. Mike McCluskey and Caleb Harper. Caleb is the executive director of the Dairy Scale for Good. The webinar will address net zero carbon emission impl implementation on the farm. The second webinar on April 20th will be presented by Dr. Androne Verbrugge from the University of Guelph well, she will unveil the newest research into mitigating feline obesity. Visit balchemanh.com slash real science for more details and to register. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. We now have 11 episodes out on YouTube, your favorite podcast platform, and also at balchemanh.com slash podcast. We go behind the scenes to hear the conversations that take place over a few drinks with friends. Search for Real Science Exchange on your favorite podcast platform and be sure to subscribe. On behalf of Balcam and Dr. Borka, thank you for joining us today.